If you have your Bibles, we've been in the book of James the last five weeks. This is week five. We're going through a nine-week series in the gospel. I mean, not the gospel, the book of James. Half-brother of Jesus. I love James because James tells it like it is. James holds back no punches. And if you came to church to be convicted, you came to the right place today. (laughs) Because it's about to get real. This is week five, we are in chapter three, and it reads this way. We're going to focus on the first 12 verses of chapter three. You guys can go ahead and put up the scriptures behind me and follow the reading as we read along. It says this, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Hello. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. If we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. It could also control ourselves in every other way. Verse 3. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in his mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing. That makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Verse 6. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. James, help us. Verse 7. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. It's a prayer. So we pour our prayer, we pour our prayer, and then you're like, that same tongue curses someone made in the image and likeness of God. And I'm just reading the Bible. Sometimes he praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes he curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come and pour out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Remember, James is sarcastic. We saw that last week. He's like, oh, you believe in God? Demons do too. Good for you. (laughs) Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Tell your neighbor, don't be salty. (laughs) Heavy stuff here from the brother of Jesus, James. And I want you to go back to the first two verses Heavy verses. He says, not all of you should strive to be teachers in the church because you will be judged more strictly. That's heavy, my friends. That gives you pause. That gives me pause. When I read that, you do some digging in the book of James, you realize that the reason why he's saying this is because In that context, people were jockeying for positions of leadership, but mainly they wanted to be on the platform. In other words, no one was jockeying for maintenance position. Which, I was here Saturday morning studying and the maintenance team was here doing what they do. And it's one of those things where you don't realize the power of it, the beauty of it until they're not doing it. Because if the place wasn't clean, you would notice. If the place wasn't taken care of, you would notice. And so shout out to those who do behind the scenes ministries. (laughs) 
But there's this, this romantic idea with the platform that James is saying, you, you want to want to take twice about being a teacher because it comes with great responsibility. And God has a different standard for those who want to teach. Think about this. When you're saying you're teaching the Bible, you're saying, I'm representing the God of the universe. That's heavy. That's no small thing. You don't, can't take that lightly. I don't know about you, but it puts a weight on me. I just said that, and my heart went a little faster on the inside. Like, we're saying we speak for God, the God of the universe. Because he judges things different from the way that we judge things. I just noticed that American Idol just finished another season, to which I was like, that's still going on? It's been like 20 plus years, I think, right? I remember in the beginning, I used to like American Idol because I liked it for the wrong reasons. I liked it when they let the wrong people sing. <laughs> you know those people? And then I found out that they do that on purpose. I read on it. I was like, oh, they actually do that on purpose. But when you listen to those people sing, I don't know about you, how you feel, but I don't blame them. I blame their friends. <laughs> it's like you don't have good friends. They let you go all the way to the American Idol. You know the friends that you were, you know, at the bar with the karaoke? It's like, you are a good singer, man. You know, friends who are under the influence of Kool-Aid talking about, like, you can sing. But the thing with American Idol is that, you know, there's judges, right? And, but they, they have criteria for how they're judging you. They're judging you based on talent and charisma. That's basically what they're looking for. They're looking for people with the talent to sing and the charisma to be able to sell what you're singing because there, there, is, there is this commercial thing that goes with the industry. And that's all fine. But the reality is when it comes to God, God goes deeper than just talent and charisma. God's looking at your character and he's looking at your lifestyle, and he's looking at deeper things that beats the surface. So it's not just having the talent to do something. Do you have the character and the lifestyle to sustain the talent? Because what people don't realize is that when you are doing the thing where you stand up and try to tell people about God, God doesn't even listen to what you have to say. He's looking at your heart. And now let me just say this because I hope you understand James starts with Bible teachers, but then he goes to the rest of the church. So no one's off the hook. Right? He starts with, yes, the, 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 the teacher who is the voice of the community. But listen, I want to make it clear here. Like if you are looking to teach ch kids, God will hold you accountable. Like we have kids right now in all these wings and there are people there, you know, vouching that they're teaching them about Jesus. And Jesus is like, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard because especially when it comes to teaching my children. So let me, let me warn us very clearly. If you are, don't have the character and the lifestyle to make up what you're doing with our kids, you better not teach our kids. I don't want anyone laying hands on our children when I don't know where your hands have been all week. Because we believe in the power of laying hands, the transfer of anointing. If you're not a tr anointing, if you're not transferring the anointing of God, you might be transferring things that shouldn't be transferred. But I'm talking about not just kids' ministry, but I'm talking about youth ministers. If your lifestyle doesn't back up what you're saying, you better not because you'll be held to a higher standard. And I'm talking about crew leaders. I'm talking about captains of teams. Anyone who says, I'm here to represent God, check your lifestyle. As you guys know very clearly that we are living in the day and age right now where we're seeing a lot of mess in the name of Jesus. We know the Catholic church mess, the corrupt priests, but also we know the shady televangelists and the weird evangelicals and all the stuff that's going on in our world in the name of Jesus. And Jesus and the church gets a black eye for every person who says they're representing him, but then we find out you got other stuff going on. So I don't take this lightly, my friends. 
I don't take this lightly. This is not a talent show. Because platform is not this. Platform is the people that God is trusting you with. That's the real platform. That if you're not up for it, it's better to say, I better get out of the way. Than to be judged by a God who sees all things. You see, Jesus was clear. He says to him, much is given, much is required. The great theologian told us with great power comes great responsibility that's theologian peter parker's uncle (laughs) uncle ben but i i want to make something clear my friends that 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 it's it's a privilege it's a privilege it's a tremendous tremendous privilege to to teach but it's also tremendous responsibility that we can't gloss over this text all week long it's been weighing on me this text. So if you, if you do feel like you have a calling to teach kids or youth or crews or you want to lead a team, listen, I, I want to I ask you some questions that I have to constantly answer for myself. And this is not all of it. This is just to give you a little bit of perspective of what goes into this. So go ahead and put up those questions. If you want to teach the Bible, you need to, you need to wrestle with these questions a few times. I said put up the questions. <laughs> Question number one, are you willing to pay the price? With every ministry, there's a price to be paid. The great King David says, I won't give God anything that doesn't cost me. See, everybody wants the final product. No one wants to go through the process. Everybody wants the platform, but no one wants the cross. And there is no platform of Jesus without the cross. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Are you willing to pay the price to teach the word of God? Number two, are you fully consecrated to God in private? Because what you see in public is 10%. Everything else happens in the private. When no one sees behind closed doors. That's why we're always shocked when we hear something crazy, but we don't realize, you know why you're shocked? Because all you saw was 10%. God's not shocked because he knows the 90%. Matter of fact, that's a great equation. Someone said, if you want to have a great indestructible life, it says focus on the 90% of your life that no one sees. Then the 10% will speak for itself. Is your phone consecrated to God? Or if someone grabs your phone, do you want it back real quick? I have zero passwords on my phone. My wife can have my phone anytime she wants. That's accountability. Are you disciplined in prayer and study? Because it's a weight. Last thing you want, I don't know if you've ever been to a church where the pastor's like, let's see what we got today. <laughs> you ever heard of the guy who said, God, I'm just going to go to your word and whatever it says today I'm going to do. And he opened up and he read, Judas hung himself. And he's like, no, no not that. <laughs> so he did it again. He played, he played Bible roulette with God. And he closed it and goes, okay, God, this time I mean it. Like, whatever you say. And he opened it up and he read, whatever you must do, do it quickly. And he's like, oh, God, that's not. Because it's no small thing. See, people don't realize a 40-minute message takes about 10 to 15 hours to put together. And sometimes I wish I was the guy who just comes in the back, sits in the back. Not judging you guys in the back. But it's easy to be the guy in the back who plays the American Idol of church. Well, the songs today was okay. I give the pastor like a five. 
because you don't know the weight of what's happening. Now realizing that you're accountable for that too. Are you modeling what you're teaching? This is why I don't want people working with our children who are not modeling a lifestyle because kids are impressionable. You, this is not do what I say, not as I do. This is follow me as I follow Jesus. If I can't say follow me as I follow Jesus, I have no business teaching about Jesus. This is about can you stand being criticized and misunderstood? Because you're not doing it right if you haven't been criticized or misunderstood. Some of the best messages I'll preach here will be the most quiet ones. Some of the best messages are the ones that people have small bladders and they got to go. Some of the best messages don't translate into what you see. It translates into what's happening in the spirit. But are you willing to be criticized? Because here's the thing I told someone this week. The moment the message leaves my mouth, I have zero control of how it gets interpreted. Every person has a filter to how they interpret the message. That's why Jesus said your heart is like a soil. Depends on what's going on in your soil. That's how you receive the message. So can you stand to be misunderstood? When all you're trying to do is help people and people think... You're doing something else. Can you, be, can you stand to be in the kitchen where everybody is grilling you because they know everything? They even know your motives. Can you stand it when people say, all church wants is your money? Keep your freaking money, man. <laughs> I'll take my peace of mind. Can you stand it when people think they're more woke than you, more theological than you, more doctrinal than you, smarter than you, they know everything more than you, and you just appear as a pawn? Because that's what it takes to do what God's called you to do. Here's one more. Do you want to be popular or faithful? Because you, you can't be both. If you struggle with pleasing people, you don't want to teach the Bible because the Bible will rub against everybody's desires and, and, and motives and intentions. You don't even have to try. Just read the Bible. If I just got up here and read the Bible all day, we'll be, we'll be at some point, there will be some type of thing that rubs against your flesh. So you have to decide, I'm either going to be faithful or I'm going to be popular because you can't be both. Not everything that's popular is right and not everything that is right is popular. So these are the things that you have to consider if you're serious about representing the God of the universe because he's not judging you based on talent and charisma. He's judging you based on your character and your lifestyle. I tell the young people who want to preach, tell them, hey, listen, I don't mind you bombing a message. It happens. Just don't bomb your life. Because God is forgiving. Humans not so much. It's amazing that humans put so much criticism into leaders, but they fail to put the same criticism on themselves. If only we judge ourselves by the same standard we judge those who are leading. But my friends, he goes on. He, he's not just talking about the leader. He's talking about the church. He says, he says a mature believer, if you're taking notes, he's saying a mature believer has to be able to master his or her tongue. That's a calling on the capital C church. Because when we don't master our tongues, we cause a lot of havoc, chaos, destruction, division, hurts, and so on. 
So James is talking about, he's doubling down. I don't know if you remember, in chapter 1 he told us, hey, I want you to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. And he's like, I got to come back to that because there's still struggles going on within the church. If you keep reading, in chapter 4 he says, man, there's so much chaos among you because you're not controlling your tongue. So James is saying, listen, it's affecting the community as a whole. And as you know, it's affecting our society right now. The power of the tongue has us divided. The power of the tongue has us not speaking to people that we love. It's Memorial Day weekend. Some some families are not even going to gather because there's some things that have been said. There are married couples not talking right now because some things that have been said. There are employees losing workers because some things that have been said. James is like, man, you, as people of God, this can't be, my friends. You can't worship God and curse people with the same mouth that God gave you. Something is wrong. Talks about the power of the tongue, and Bible writers are always trying to illustrate their point. And here, James uses three different analogies or illustrations of the power of the small thing. Three things. Go ahead and put up that next. Go one more. It says three things, right? It says. The power of the tongue is like the bit on the, mouth's ho- on the mouth of a horse. You know how big a horse is, but that little bit is able to control the horse and tame the horse. It says, man, a ship, she a ship that big, that small, those small rudders at the bottom there is controlling that massive ship. Blows my mind. A thing that big is controlled by those little Brothers on the bottom that you will never see. And then he says, man, don't you know a little spark leads to a forest burnt down. He says, that's what happens when you don't control the power of the tongue. A little spark, here goes the marriage. A little spark, here goes the vision in the church. A little spark... Here goes a friendship. A little Facebook post. All hell breaks loose. Because of the abundance of the heart, the mouth tweets. (laughs) Say, my friends, pay attention to the inconsistency of your tongue. It says, it's like a deadly poison. That kills you softly and slowly. Every word matters. James is saying. You can't praise and curse. Curse and praise. I heard the story of a woman who went up to John Wesley. John Wesley was a great, one of probably one of the great church fathers of the 18th century. He brought the revival, especially to England. A lot of the songs we sing, a lot of hymns come from John and Charles Wesley. But he said a woman came up to John Wesley and said, I think I found my talent from God. She said, my talent from God is to speak my mind. To which John Wesley replied, I don't think God would mind if you bury that talent. (laughs) We live in a society where... A lot of people think that's the gift. So whatever comes to mind, I'm going to say it or I'm going to post about it. Not realizing you might be sparking the wrong forest. See, James says that there's a choice there in the power of our tongue. He says your, your tongue could be on fire for two reasons. It could be on fire because it's being... Is being motivated by hell, or it could be on fire because it's motivated by heaven. What is hell? Understand what hell is. Everybody thinks hell is a place where you go to burn. No, hell is a place, but hell doesn't start there. Hell starts now. 
The place is just the continuation where you started here. Hell is the absence of everything that is God, everything that's opposite of God. James is like, when you're speaking a certain way, you're speaking the language of hell. What is the language of hell? Division, strife, cynicism, judgmentalism. Hell is opposite of everything that God is. He says, man, you, you, you don't you understand your tongue is on fire, but you have the choice. Your tongue could be on fire for heaven. Because when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers the first time in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says he rested on them like tongues of fire that comes to purify you so that now you can be anointed to speak life and to speak the things that God wants you to speak. So fire could be destructive, but fire could be productive. It all depends on what you're burning. So he says you have the choice now. Now that you're a believer, you can't just say, this is just who I am. It's like, no, no, you are a believer now. You are born again. Now you have power and your tongue can speak life and your tongue can edify. Your tongue can help, not hurt. Your tongue can unite, not divide. You have a choice to make with how you want to go about it. But your tongue has to be consecrated to the Lord. You know, the sad reality is this. Some people could be on the way to heaven but live like hell. Because they trusted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their lives, but they haven't trusted him with his tongue or her tongue (laughs) to actually bless people. There's so much the Bible has to say about the power of the tongue. The Bible says there's life and death in the power of the tongue. Did you know that that the Bible says that God spoke the universe into existence? The power of the tongue. In other words, your words can create worlds or can destroy them. You can edify your marriage or you can kill your marriage. You can edify your kids or you can exasperate your kids. You can can bless another believer or you can curse another believer. You can speak unity or you can speak division all in the same mouth. If our tongues are not consecrated, we're wreaking havoc. We're bringing more hell instead of bringing heaven. Let me give you an example. In Isaiah chapter 50, it tells you about the power of a consecrated tongue. Go ahead and put up the next scripture. It says, look, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed what? A well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. In other words, man, my tongue is so well-instructed, it's going to sustain someone who needs a word. It's going to bless someone. He wakens me, watch this, morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. I think that should sound familiar because James told us, right, be quick to listen. Slow to speak, then slow to get angry. In other words, man, I don't have that blessing on my tongue if I'm not first listening. See, we reverse that. We are quick to speak, slow to listen, and quick to get angry. And we're leaving trails of destruction behind us with the power of our words. We're not anointed, consecrated. But if you're paying attention, you have to understand this. The problem is not the tongue. The real problem that we have is what's going on in our hearts. Because the tongue only reflects the heart. And you know your heart gives you away because you can't fake the funk. Sooner or later, your heart betrays you by what you say. Jesus says this. He says, watch this, in Matthew 12, go ahead, go to the next scripture. Jesus says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil. Watch this. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. You know what idle means? Useless. Pervasive, not spirit-filled, not wisdom-like, 
Just diarrhea of the mouth. But watch this. This this blew my mind. Jesus says, the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Think about that for a second. He said, people say, how can God judge? God's like, I'm not judging you. I'm just putting up the mirror. You judge yourself. I'm Kay Verdon. Kay Verdon's have a Proverbs. The Proverbs goes something like this. Peshita mari pa se You know what that means? Fish die by his own mouth. No one makes the fish take the hook. I don't know about you, but this gives me pause. We live in a very opinionated world. God's like, I take every word into account. Words spoken, words posted. And I don't know about you, it makes me want to repent from things I haven't even done yet. (laughs) You know, our tongues must be consecrated, my friends. We have a hard issue. It's amazing to me how you can meet people who've been in church for 20, 30 years. You're like, what are you ever going to change? Because it's not the amount of time you've been in church. It's the amount of surrendering that you do that says that God is really working on me. And then people in church for a year will blow your mind how much they grow because they surrender. I don't know about you, but I've been in church long enough where I've been pleasantly surprised and I've been shockingly surprised by people. I'm like, I thought we were on the same page. See, people, we don't show our true colors when everything's good. We show our true colors when we're under pressure. Man, when we're on vacation, we're anointed, we're, we're blessed, we're sanctified, we're set apart for Jesus. And then a hard situation hits. And the real us come out. And what do we normally say? Because I've said it, right? Oh, that wasn't me. I wasn't thinking. It's like, uh, well. <laughs> no, you just gave us a peek into <laughs> peekaboo. <laughs> God goes straight to the heart. Because we can do the reverse too, right? The reverse is, is to say things we don't mean. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Flattery is also sin. Praise the Lord, pastor, hallelujah. (laughs) But in your heart. See, this is why God says he judges different. Because God wants the heart attached with the mouth. He wants you to be one. You know what word integrity means? One. I'm the same person in church, in the gym, online, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. One. Because one of the most frustrating things about leading a church this big is that people will encounter some people who go to church, but they're not surrendered. But they're wearing a new life shirt. The shirt says new life, but the heart, though. And then the whole church pays a price. Aren't you guys the... Yeah, we're trying to be. Some of us need to surrender more. So we can actually be more of a blessing to those around us. Because you can't give what you don't have. You just can't fake the funk. I, I can go... To Burger King, you don't mean I work there. I use theologian Wisby's commentary when I study, and he's a great man of God who passed away now, but great work. And in his commentary on the book of James, it's very interesting because he's, you know, he's like, usually we're waiting for deep words, deep revelations. 
But he's like, we miss the mark because we miss the daily subtle things that reveals our hearts. So he says, he says I want to give you 12 words that can transform your heart. Because you want it to be the same with what you're saying. He says, these, these are the 12 words. It blew my mind. Watch this, right? He says, please and thank you. I'm sorry. I love you. I'm praying for you. Think about the power of those 12 words. Starting with please and thank you. Like he's saying, please and thank you is not old school. Please and thank you is what actually shows appreciation and blesses a marriage. You know how many marriages are in trouble because we stop saying please and thank you? You know how many businesses have gone wrong because there's entitlement now? Because we forgot that on the other side of this conversation is a human being made in the image and likeness of God. And that please and thank you goes a long way. It's not deep theological words. It's just everyday words. How about this one? I'm sorry. You know how many of us, pride keeps us from saying sorry. Some people are never wrong, but they never right neither. (laughs) Says I'm sorry breaks walls and builds bridges. You know how many misunderstanding would go away with just the words, I'm sorry. You know what we're finding out? I just read this. Psychologist psychologist is telling us this. He said, the longer you live with someone, the less you know what they're thinking. You would think it's the other way around, right? He's saying, oh, the reason why that is is because we take for granted that we know what the other person's thinking. But we don't actually inquire. We just assume and what's one of, the, one of the saddest things you hear in a relationship, right? We grew apart. But it's like, when did you grow apart? When you stop checking in and actually caring about what the other person's thinking. Listen, I'm telling you, I've been pleasantly surprised by this and, and wrongly surprised. Like some people that I thought, I thought we were on the same page. All of a sudden, oh, I didn't know you were thinking like that the whole time. Here I am thinking we're under the same roof. We must be on the same page. How many people live in the same house but on different pages? And how many relationships would mend if we just started with, I'm sorry? I'm sorry breaks walls and builds bridges. About I love you. And, and he's not talking I love you just from a romantic standpoint. I hope you do say I love you to your significant other. Okay, we got much deeper issues. <laughs> But he's talking as a Christ-like love you. Like you're another human being made in the image and likeness of God. If you don't see another human being made in the image and likeness of God, your heart has problems. Because we live in a society now where we, we see enemies. We see people that we need to tell them like it is. <laughs> and we're missing... A simple thing, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love your self. Our society is great at categorizing people. God's like, I I only have one category, humanity. How about this one? I'm praying for you. You know... You want to disarm someone, tell them I'm praying for you. People won't know what to do with you. But it's how you say it too. Because I've heard this, I'm going to pray for you. It's like, please don't. Because that prayer ain't going nowhere. That's the prayer that hits the ceiling and comes right back. I'm going to pray for you. My God will show you. God's like, I ain't show you nothing. I'm praying for you. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Christians crack me up. It's like, no, the, the power of disarming a situation. When you genuinely say, I'm praying for you. But here's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to practice this lately. If I say I'm going to pray for you, I'm praying for you right now. 
I don't want to do the thoughts and prayers. You know, the media is great at thoughts and prayers, but who's praying? Like, if I say I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to pray for you right now. Like, some of you today, you, you come up to me like, I need prayer. We're, we're praying right now. You guys know I do that. Run us like we're praying right now. Tell me we're praying in this moment because I don't want to just give you lip service. Because Christians, we're good at lip service. On the earth we shine your face. And the Holy Spirit is like, there's a guy next to you you haven't forgiven. You're going home. Instead of bringing that spirit home with you, you, you just did a religious thing. Words that will transform you from the inside out. I want to leave you with a prayer that I pray daily. Because I take this very serious. It's out of Psalm 19. I pray this every day. I'm waiting for that. <laughs> I don't know who's in the back today, but God bless. Pray for me, I'll pray for you. That was a genuine joke. We got to be careful nowadays. We got people rushing the stage. Comedians are speaking. People are losing their minds. Security, be ready. I'll tackle someone in Jesus' name. I've done it before. We've had that. (laughs) But this is a daily prayer, my friends. I really pray this every day. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's a daily prayer. Because our words carry a lot of weight. Don't ever let people lie to you when they say, I don't care what you say. The moment they say that, they care. Words hurt. Words hurt. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that I haven't been hurt. I've been hurt, especially when you're trying to make a difference and people take it the wrong way. That stuff hurts. If I don't go to God, I'll take it out the wrong way. May the words of my mouth. Notice, though, it's not just the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart. Because sometimes your heart is not aligned with what you're saying. Think about it. If the meditation of your heart is not right, you might kill Shaquina. (laughs) But it's hard to be mad at Shaquina when you're praying for Shaquina. It's hard to stay bitter cynical, judgmental, when you're actually praying for another human being made in the image and likeness of God. We're carrying around so much resentment, so much bitterness, so much anger. Our hearts become harder and harder. The Bible says don't let your heart become hard. You know what a hard heart is? It doesn't receive. That's why the meditation of the heart is so important because it's saying, hey, you live from within. And sooner or later, what's within will betray you. Everything starts from within. That's why we need to be born again. We need, to be, we need a heart transformation. My friends, getting baptized today is awesome, but you need a daily surrender to his will and to his purpose. It's a daily walk. The moment you get baptized, all hell breaks loose. But that is the greatest testimony that God is actually working on you if you daily say, Lord, may today my words, my meditation be pleasing to you. Because I don't know about you, it breaks my heart every time you hear, oh, this person supposed to represent Jesus did something weird and shady. It breaks my heart. It breaks all of us. The dying world out there in need of Jesus. And when these things happen, the world says, Why should I pay attention to you guys? Look at what you do. And that's sad. That's why he's saying not all of you should teach. Because it comes with a responsibility. It comes with a heavy responsibility. But if God's calling you, it's because he's the one that will equip you and empower you. That's why you need to be spirit-filled. 
Because the spirit brings self-control. Self-control means I don't say just everything. I'll leave you with this. The apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, he says, he says, brothers, whatever is true, noble, praiseworthy, excellent. He says, think about such things. To which I want to add, don't just think about them. Talk about such things. And only post things that can fit in those filters. Is it true? Is it noble? Is it praiseworthy? Is it excellent? If it doesn't fit those filters, then I need to shut up. Can I give you homework? (laughs) I love it. It's so real. Homework. (laughs) There's a great book in the Bible called Proverbs. It's just a a sayings of wisdom. Because we don't want knowledge, we want wisdom. I've told you this. Knowledge is just information. Wisdom is how to apply it. So there's a book of Proverbs. Here's what I love about the book of Proverbs. It has a lot to say about the power of your words. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, which means you can read one a day for the next month. And one proverb a day will keep the doctor away. Okay, that's my prescription to you. Okay. What what are you, you're struggling with your tongue. I'm going to prescribe Proverbs for you for the next month. What if we took the word of God the way we take what the doctors say? Because we are a doctor, you know. We just treat the heart. Not the physical heart. But the heart that is you, your soul, your real you. Stand with me as we pray this morning and get ready to baptize these amazing people. Your words carry weight. You can build or you can destroy. You can unite or you can divide. You can bless or you can curse. It's all about the choice that you're making to surrender your life. Not just your tongue, but your heart to the Lord. Because you will be accountable for every word, everything you post. Here's, here's an interesting one. Now we have reviews for everything. And some people are destroying other people's business based on their review. But we, as God's people, can I tell you something? What if that person just had a bad day? What if their business is not like that always? Do we have grace in us to say, wait, I'm going to give this person grace because maybe this does not always happens. I don't want my review to be the reason why this business, this person is trying to take care of their family, gets hurt and destroyed by a bad reputation that I accounted to, attribute to by my own review. Because we live in a day and age where I have to have an opinion about everything. I'm changing the world one review at a time. <laughs> no, you're destroying the world one review at a time. Let's measure our words because they carry weight. One word of encouragement will go a long way. One word can change someone's life. We're here because people have invested in us, spoke words over us. You know, prayer is words, right? You pray over people. Someone doesn't have to know you're praying for them. Just pray for them. Go to your job and just say, God, I'm going to pray for my job every day. And watch the atmosphere you're creating at your job. You're creating an atmosphere of blessings. I keep waiting for my sweet song, Kofu. i just not coming. Pray for me while I pray for you. (laughs) Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. Your word that cuts through everything and it gets to the bottom of what really matters. Father, today we, we, we read about the power of your word and we don't want to just read about it. We want to live like people who are anointed by you. Jesus, we want to be those who chooses to bless. Those who choose to create worlds those who choose to encourage, those who choose the right words at the right time. God, we want our tongue to be well instructed by you. So we pray like the psalmist pray, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And when we do fall short, Holy Spirit, empower us 
empower us to say words like, I'm sorry. I love you. I'm praying for you. Empower us to be catalysts of change. And refrain our tongue from speaking things that we shouldn't. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. I pray for those who need to surrender their lives to you because without a surrender life, our words will betray us. We don't want to hear, I never knew you. We want to hear, well done. So Holy Spirit, minister to every one of us. We want to lift up especially the brothers and sisters who are getting baptized today, Lord. I pray that there is an exchange happening in that water, that the old is gone, the new has come, and that they'll be spirit-filled coming out of that water, living for the glory and honor of your name. And may you use them to be a blessing to those around them. And I pray also that you use their lives today, their testimonies today, to speak to others in this room or watching online. Because the Bible says we overcome by the word of our testimonies. So Holy Spirit, have your way in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. Amen.